Governor, uh, during the first 100 days of your presidency, what steps would you take to end the heroin and opioid epidemic? This was uh, asked by uh, CADCA. The, the first thing is that is to is to acknowledge that uh, how the president talks about this matters. All right, so I'll get the concrete steps too, but I, I think how you talk about it is a concrete step. Uh, we don't talk about this in public as a disease. We talk about this as a moral failing. We've been programmed by our society to talk about this as a moral failing. And as long as we continue to do that, um, we're going to continue to treat this differently than other diseases. So right from the beginning, and I've been doing this as governor and I would do it as president, you have to talk about this as a disease that can be treated, that needs to be treated, and needs to be acknowledged as a disease and not a moral failing. That's the first thing. Secondly, I would instruct the Attorney General to set up drug courts in every district, federal district in the country. Um, there is no reason for us not to have drug court in the federal district courts. We are jailing many too many people whose offense is that they're addicted to drugs. We put them into federal prison, we don't give them treatment, and then they come out and they have even greater problems when they come out and we wonder why. Well, you know, if you had a cancer patient um, who was taking certain things illegally um, to try to help their disease, you jailed them for it, you put them in jail and didn't treat them for a year or two years or three years, and then they came out and they were sicker, no one would wonder why. Yet with this disease, we somehow are mystified how sending someone into a jail cell without treatment um, doesn't make them better. Uh, so I would set up drug courts um, and instruct the Attorney General to do so in all 93 federal districts across the country. Um, lastly, um, I would end jailing first-time nonviolent, non-dealing drug offenders. Um, we have done this in New Jersey. It's not impossible. We have done it. Um, I signed the law uh, almost two years ago now that says in New Jersey now there are drug courts in every county, and if you are a first-time nonviolent, non-dealing offender, you go to one-year mandatory inpatient treatment, not to jail. Um, you know, I had an argument with the legislature about this. They said, well, it shouldn't be mandatory. It should be optional. And I said, you've obviously never met someone with this disease. Because <laughs> you give them the option, they're not taking it. Some will, but most won't. But once you get them into that environment where they can begin to heal and begin to hear that treatment and recovery is possible. And it's not only possible, but is preferable to the life that they're living. So that's why I think mandatory treatment at the federal level as well is incredibly important. How do you change the stigma? Back to your first statement that you made. Uh, I mean, listen, I think it starts with the president. You know, leaders can change attitudes in this country by not only how they talk, but what they choose to talk about. So for me in New Jersey, I have spent a lot of time over the course of the last six years talking about this problem and talking about it from a personal perspective. You know, um, I, I frequently talk to people about this difference that we see between diseases, and I personalize it. My mother was an addict. She was addicted to smoking. She started smoking when she was 16 years old in 1948 when no one knew it was bad for you. It was the cool thing to do, and she did it, and she became addicted. And I watched my mother over her entire life struggle with trying to stop smoking. What she knew it was bad for, what she was pregnant with me and my brother, she smoked throughout. She didn't want to. She couldn't stop. And she tried gum and patches. Um, she even tried hypnosis at one point, which we enjoyed because it kind of mellowed her out a little bit, which <laughs> with my mother was really good, but it did nothing for the smoking, so she stopped. Um, but when my mother inevitably then, at 71 years old, was diagnosed with lung cancer, no one said to us, She's getting what she deserves. She made a choice. And she's getting what she deserves. Don't treat her. Let her die. Because she's getting what she deserves. Everyone said, get her help, get her, treat, you know, get her treatment. What type of chemotherapy? What type of radiation? What's the prognosis? People prayed for her. I wonder if they would have reacted the same way if I said, my mother's a heroin addict. I think not. Because they would have that moral judgment. So 
we need to talk about this in ways that are not only clinical, but are personal. And if the president stands behind the seal of the presidency and talks about this from a personal perspective, I think it begins to lower the stigma. Then once the way we take care of people will lower that stigma too. So if you're not throwing people in jail for it, we don't throw people in jail for cancer. If we're not throwing people in jail for this, then that will help to lower the stigma too. Now, people who commit violent acts and people who are dealing and making money from putting this poison into our families, there will always be a jail cell in my world for them. But, but there's a big distinction between those folks and the folks who are addicted and suffering from this disease. And um, I think you lower the stigma by talking about it a lot and by talking about it in very personal ways so that people know that it's okay to talk about it. Part of the problem we have too is who talks about this? You know, you don't, you know, go to a neighborhood dinner party and say, hey, how you doing? My daughter's addicted to heroin. What's new with you? <laughs> but if your daughter had cancer, you would tell them. And that's my point. We are contributing to the stigma by our unwillingness to talk about it openly. And we need to talk about it openly as a disease that can be treated, needs to be treated, and should be treated. That's why I think you do it. The next question is submitted by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's just, you know. Don't blame the messenger. That's uh, all right. I just went to law school. That's all. So I don't know if I'll understand this, but let's give it a shot. All right. The private recovery treatment industry is quite often very expensive to the average family, even with insurance coverage. How would you address the gap in treatment availability and access for the middle class? Well, part of this is that we need to move funding from corrections to treatment. So that if you, what we're seeing in New Jersey is, for instance, it costs us $49,000 a year to jail someone in our state prison system. It costs us $24,000 a year to give them inpatient drug treatment. So part of this is gonna be a reallocation of resources. As we lower the prison population, and we've seen this in New Jersey, you're going to be able, some of those are built in costs, but when you get to the point where you're gonna be able to close a state prison, which we're very close to being able to do, you can then shift those resources to the treatment side um, and keep your budget flat from an overall perspective, but move resources. And I think that's where government resources have to be moved. We, we have to take them out of the corrections area and move them to the treatment area. Uh, we're still gonna be taking care of people, just in a different way. We're still gonna be trying to give people the tools they need, because remember, it's called corrections, right? The idea was we're correcting whatever behavior occurred that put you there. So I'm just moving it from incarceration correction to treatment correction. And, and that's what we're looking to do. And I think that's part of the way to help to make up this gap. Also, I think we have to ask more of the insurance companies on this as well. Um, and, and that's things that we can do through laws that we pass and regulation. Um, because again, that's part of the stigmatization of this disease, is that somehow other diseases are worthy of coverage, but this is not. And, and so saying to the insurance companies, you know, this has got to be treated like any other disease. Uh, you know, experimental treatments to you done differently and paid for differently, but the treatments that we know work are paid for. And we certainly have a track record of showing that treatment in this area can work and work very effectively and that it needs to extend into recovery. So let's use that track record as a basis to demand more of the insurance companies also. There's a lot of people in corrections that are here in the room today. How do you tell them we're cutting funding from you and putting it elsewhere. We're cutting funding from you and putting it elsewhere. <laughs> and, and by the way, we're not gonna be asking you to do more with less. We're gonna be asking you to do less with less, right? We're moving people out of that part of the system and moving them to another system. And so it's not where I'm saying to folks in corrections, you're gonna have to do it more with less. I'm telling them you're gonna have to do less with less. And, and that's appropriate and smart and the right thing to do. So, I, I, listen, maybe it's because I'm from New Jersey. I don't really have a hard time with this. 
you know, we, we're gonna we're doing it differently. And you know, I'm I'm really proud. I've I've the, I've the, you know, my wife is here today, and so is the chairman of my parole board. Um, and and Jim Plotius is here. He he was the United States Marshal when I was the United States Attorney. Um, we share a common approach and philosophy to these things, and he has been an extraordinary force for good on the treatment side as chairman of the state parole board. And so um, when he heard I was doing this event up here today, he wanted to be up here with me too. So Jim, stand up and let everybody say hi to you. Um, he's done. And for those of you who want, when he's hanging around later, you can ask him questions about what we're doing in New Jersey as well. He's done um, a really great job from the parole board perspective in administering people into reentry. And those folks who are addicted and have other issues into reentry into the system, our parole board's been very, very, I think, forward thinking on that. Next question is submitted by Faces and Voices of Recovery. Untreated addiction often leads to other problems, such as heart disease, lower work productivity, overcrowded jails, and developmental damage to the addicted person's children. Yet millions of Americans fall victim to the stigma surrounding addiction and in turn become reluctant to seek proper treatment. If elected, will you take action to decrease those stigmas, as you mentioned earlier, and increase access to addiction treatment and recovery services? Yeah, I think I've already answered this one. And, and, I, and, and I would just tell you that, you know, it's not just going to be my obligation, it's going to be yours too. You know, when, when you see today all the people who are here, all the people you have coming here to answer your questions, and all the coverage that you have um, from the media, you're starting to get it. And, and you're speaking out, the parents, the children, the brothers and sisters, the friends of people who suffer from this disease are starting to speak out. And so a president can lead in that direction, do the things that I've already talked about, but also part of a president's job is to recruit followers to this cause and to have those followers be vocal and to have those followers push the president when the president isn't doing enough. I'm sure when I'm president, I'm going to get distracted by a few other things, right? And I need folks like you who are part of the cause that we've all worked on and developed together to continue to keep me and my administration focused on this as a priority. I hope that I'll always keep it focused that way, but I can't guarantee every minute of every day I will. And you need to be part of it. So the lowering of the stigma is also about your voices. And, and you know, it could be a chicken or the egg kind of argument at times but you've got to have the courage to speak out. And if you're here, you already do. So I'm preaching to the converted, but it, it, is, it is very important. It is very important that we do this together um, and speak out about this together. That will be the only thing that will lower stigma because it's the only thing that ever has lowered stigma is the fact that society begins in larger and larger numbers to speak out in a different way about a topic that previously was stigmatized. And that's the way you get this done. Council of State Governments Justice Center. Next question. A 2012 report by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University found that the vast majority of people in need of addiction treatment do not receive anything that approximates evidence-based care. In many places, someone qualifies as an addiction specialist simply because they have battled an addiction themselves. What will you do to improve the likelihood that when an addict is placed in treatment, that treatment is effective? Well, those are two different questions, right? I mean, you're drawing a direct line between the qualifications of the person providing the treatment to the effectiveness of the treatment. And I think that's partially true. But we also know that we have seen friends of ours, neighbors of ours, who have gone to great places for addiction treatment and treatment has not been effective. So let's not make it a causal relationship solely. So yes, I think as you get more government money involved in this, unfortunately there's gonna be more government regulation. I say unfortunately because often that is a problem. In this instance, I think it might be helpful um, because for folks that have certain qualifications and background and experience to be able to provide this treatment helps to take some of the charlatans out of this business, the real ill-intentioned folks, and some folks who are well-intentioned but just not well-prepared. But let us always remember that 
this is about the patient. And the patient and their family has to be buying into this as well. They could have the most wonderful, progressive treatment that our current knowledge allows us to provide. And if they are not ready to engage in that treatment in a meaningful way and their family or loved ones are not ready to support them in the recovery process, then relapse will occur. Even when all those circumstances are present, relapse occurs. You know, and it's, it's, it's funny, I, you know, I, I've said to folks that, you know, the first time you go and have an intervention with someone, everyone, everyone feels righteous. Those of you who are intervening feel righteous. The person who's intervened with, once they give in to the idea of going to seek treatment, feels righteous. But then, if relapse occurs, people want to walk away. They feel like we should have to do this once. I should have to intervene with you once. You should go seek treatment once, and then we should be done with this. That should be it. We hear about one day at a time, but we don't really believe it. We need to believe it. We need to believe it. And so, so that's why one of the things we've done in New Jersey is we now instituted in five of our most challenged counties in terms of drug addiction, um, government funded recovery coaches. And so, so it seemed to me that when, when I mandated the use of Narcan in every county in our state, which we did well over a year and a half ago, um, and we supplied, the state supplies the Narcan to every um, police department in our state. We have 566 municipalities in our state. We supply it to every one of them, and we supply training to those officers on how to use Narcan. Um, but what we were hearing back from families when we first started this program, we were saving a lot of lives. And then they'd say they fall right back into it. So now in these five counties, what you get is if you go to the hospital having been reversed by Narcan, when you come to the very first person you see is a recovery coach. And, and that person, depending upon what stage you're at, that person then helps direct you to the right type of treatment, stays in touch with you through the treatment, and then is, for, is there for you on the back end as you then progress from treatment to recovery. And so I think all these things are things that are important to focus on and not just the qualifications of the person providing the treatment. We have to watch for all those people involved, but we've got to make the process longer and more fulsome. Because if we don't, then the money we're investing in treatment often, not always, but often can be wasted. And then we discourage and dispirit the family members who have been brave enough to intervene and do the things they needed to do and the sacrifices they've made to get their person in their family or their friend treatment when in fact they relapse and then we begin to get discouraged and don't engage in the same way. Katka, they wanna know if you support increased funding for drug and alcohol prevention programs in all of the nation's schools and communities to address the problems of prescription drug abuse, illegal drug use and underage drinking. Yes and no. Um, I have to tell you that I think that I think that really starts and is most effective at home. I do think that schools should play a role in this and be talking about it in the context of, of good health and appropriate conduct. I don't know that we need increased funding for this. It's going on in many, many places. Some of it government sponsored, some of it charitably sponsored. You know, we have an enormous DARE program in, in, in our state that, that has been supported both with government funding and with, with um, charitable funding as well. I, you know, I, I think that you know, part of the prescription drug problem is one that government has to be more aggressive on themselves. For instance, a year and a half or so ago, I went to the Medical Society of New Jersey. We had a voluntary program where doctors who were um, 
writing prescriptions for opioids could um, be in a registry um, so that we could keep track and, and try to prevent the doctor shopping that goes on so often by addicts who are going from doctor to doctor to get their opioids. We only had about 27% participation when I went and gave the speech to the Medical Society. And what I did was I went to the Medical Society and said, you all tell me you hate government regulation. You all tell me you hate government mandates. And I said, yet I set up a voluntary program for you to participate in, and you, only 27% of you participate. So here's my deal. Either you get people to participate in this thing, or I'm going to mandate it. We're now up to over 80% participation voluntarily. <laughs> now, some people, that's called New Jersey voluntary, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, it's still voluntary. And, and we need to be doing these things on that end as well. It's not just enough to talk to these young people about the prescription drug issue and problem. We need to stop these physicians. I'll give you one example that's personal to me. Um, uh, last, not this summer, but the summer of 2014, um, our oldest daughter, Sarah, was 18 years old at the time, she got two wisdom teeth taken out. The doctor wrote her a prescription for 30 Percocet. 30 Percocet for two wisdom teeth. I mean, I looked at her and said, like, take an Advil and go to sleep, all right? Like, I'm not letting you take these Percocet. Um, you talk about stigma before, and we're talking about how to be most effective. I mean, we've got to sit on the medical profession in this country because they are writing these prescriptions much too freely. There is no reason an 18-year-old girl needs 30 Percocet for having two wisdom teeth out. No reason. And yet they have the absolute unfettered authority with a prescription pad to do this. And you wonder, I certainly do, whether part of their, their incentives for this is financial. Yeah, right? I'm trying to be nice now. Come on. I have this, I have this reputation. I'm trying to be nice, okay? But I think we really need to be looking at that. When you talk about that overall question, it is not just about more funding to prevention programs in schools where we tell kids this. We shouldn't be handing an 18-year-old kid 30 Percocet and thinking everything's going to be okay. I don't care how much prevention I give them. Because a doctor just gave that to them. And we've taught them that doctors are there to help them. So why would my daughter be wrong to take it? What would she learn in school that would tell her not to take it? She'd say, well, the doctor gave it to me. I didn't go buy it on the street. The doctor gave it to me. So this is a more complicated issue than just that. We need to push on the other end as well to say to the medical profession, you are hurting, not helping, when you don't thoughtfully use these narcotics. And, and I think we need to push on that more than we need more money for prevention programs. So what is the biggest hurdle to combating the overall addiction problem? And that, in, that includes the opioids, that in, includes other drugs, alcohol as well. It, it's a few things, I think. First of all, it's treatment availability. Um, it has to be increased. And the only way that's going to happen is a joint effort by the private sector and the public sector, the government, to do that. Um, second, we've talked about stigma a lot today, and I think that's a large part of it. Um, I, I think the third piece that we, that we, have, to, that we have to think about with this is our own attitudes towards relapse. We have to expect that relapse is going to happen. And we can't see it as a permanent failure. But we need to see it and talk about it as another step on the road to recovery. An unfortunate one, one that we would hope to prevent. Um, but those are our are, are hurdles. And I think the you know, for me, the, the last one I'd mention is that, you know, even when you get treatment availability, even when you're lowering stigma, even when you're accounting for relapse, um, the last part of this is getting buy-in from our communities about the fact that um, having a treatment center in your neighborhood um, is, is akin to having a hospital in your neighborhood. No one objects to having hospitals in their neighborhoods, but they do object to having treatment centers in their neighborhoods. That's another hurdle, because the private sector at times is having problems in, in, in zoning places like this and getting neighborhoods to be willing, 
because they say, oh, we're going to have drug addicts in our neighborhood. You know, you have sick people in your neighborhood who are going someplace to get help. And, and uh, getting us to the point where we're not worried about that stuff is, is important. And I just thought about one more. Mixed messaging has to end. Okay, we've got to stop with this recreational use of marijuana being okay in this country. I mean, you know, like, I, I feel at times that, you know, I'm not a lone voice on this, but I don't hear it nearly as enough as I think we need to. I mean, I went to Colorado for the second presidential debate, and I had a student, um, we were at University of Colorado Boulder, and I had a student say to me, you're wrong on marijuana, you know, as I was, as I was, I was walking through this labyrinth to get into the debate. And I turned and looked at him and I said, listen, man, I'll make one thing clear to you. I said, I'm going to be president of the United States, so get high now. <laughs> get high now. Because when I'm president, you're not going to be able to, all right? Not, you know, from some, you know, pot shop on the corner in Boulder, Colorado. I, when, when I was there in Colorado, Mary Pat and I read a story in the paper. They had a summit, a K-12 education summit in Colorado where the parents and the administrators determined that the number one public education challenge in the state of Colorado today is marijuana. That kids are bringing edibles into school and that they're getting high during school. And like, listen, I, physics and math were tough enough for me straight. <laughs> I were ever high, I would, no hope. Like, no hope, right? I mean, we're sending mixed messages, everybody. And quite frankly, it's less my generation than the ones that are just a little bit older than me. You like children of the 60s, right? I was born in 62, so I missed that fun. Um, you know, I got into the 70s when life became a little weirder in different ways. But you guys are sending mixed messages. You smoked pot when you were in high school and college because you were cool and you were flower children and you were for peace and love and all the rest of that stuff. I, I read all about it. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> it's a different world now. And it is clearly a gateway drug. It clearly affects people's cognitive abilities. It clearly affects their abilities to focus and work and be productive. And under what set of circumstances are we saying this is okay. It, it makes no sense to me. Because from an absolute fact-based perspective, there's no justification for it. So the reason that so many people are giving into it is because they don't want to seem old and stodgy and inflexible and all the rest of this stuff. Well, you're worried about stigma? How about changing your attitude on that? I mean... I don't care, listen, I could care less how many college students yell at me about this. I'm an adult, and I'm gonna act like an adult. And we got too many adults in this country that are sending mixed messages. So you wanna talk about hurdles? Man, that's a mixed message. You know, don't you do drugs. However, you know, recreational use of marijuana is okay, because you know, I did it when I was young, so what the hell, why not? I give you a bunch of reasons why not. And we need a president who's gonna speak very clearly on this. And not to mention the fact, sounding stodgy, it is against the law. Like, let's just, there's federal law that says marijuana is a prohibited drug. So like, I hate to be technical about this <laughs> and go all lawyer and prosecutor on you, but it's illegal. And we now have a joker in the Oval Office who says, it's okay if you legalize it in Colorado. Go ahead. It's against the law, man. Like, do one of two things. Either enforce the law or have the guts to go and change it, Mr. President. Go to Congress and stand in the well of the House in your State of the Union address and say, I believe it's time to legalize marijuana in the United States of America for any use. You know why he won't do that? because it's politically unpopular. So this child of the 60s, who we now have in the White House, is you know, unable to absent himself from his history of use 
and be able now to say no as an adult leader. I will have no problem doing that. There will be no mixed messages from the White House. I will not be misunderstood. Marijuana laws will be enforced in this country, and the people in Colorado and the other states that have legalized it, like I said to that kid at University of Colorado at Boulder, get high now. The clock is ticking. I'm coming in January of 17, and we're going to end the game. Governor Chris Christie, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you all.